Yeah. Good morning or good afternoon all. Uh, we're going to get started today because we've got a lot to get through today. So it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's British Safety Council International Safety Awards webinar. My name is Ruth Mullen and I'm the Head of Membership Awards and Communities at the British Safety Council. Today I'm joined with Neil Stone, our Chief Adjudicator, and Christine Cadman, who is our Independent Adjudicator for the International Safety Awards Scheme. Both Neil and Chris will be sharing their expertise, outlining common pitfalls and top tips to support you and your colleagues better understand the International Safety Awards application questions and marking scheme, and I will be handing over to them shortly. Next slide, please, Susanna. So as I mentioned, the, today, uh, the focus of today's webinar is to provide you with a solid overview of the International Safety Awards scheme. I will be providing an outline of the key dates, Following this, I'll go through the auto entry and free to entry, enter awards associated with the scheme. Then I will be handing over to Neil and Chris for the main part of the webinar, where they will be going through the questions, marking scheme and common pitfalls and top tips. Both Chris and Neil are highly experienced practitioners who have worked with the British Safety Council for many years and have a lot of expertise and knowledge in what it takes to submit an excellent ISA application. And we will be using the majority of today's webinar to focus on this. So just for your interest, unlike the previous ISA International Safety Awards webinars, today we'll not be offering a step-by-step -step guide for how to submit your application on the awards platform. However, in the weeks before the International Safety Awards deadline, we will be running a series of webinars on how to navigate our awards platform, and we will be circulating further information on how to reserve your spot for these in the coming weeks. Next slide, please. So you can see here the key dates for the awards. One of the most important dates to take note of is the application submission deadline, which falls on Friday the 10th of February at 5 p.m. UK time. In addition to the International Safety Awards, we also have a series of auto and free to enter awards. So these awards are open to all and an excellent way to recognize shining stars and impressive team efforts across a range of areas. The free to enter awards are open for submission after the International Safety Awards close. So don't worry about trying to remember all of these dates right now, because we will certainly share these with you and we'll contact you via email when, you're, when it's time to apply. You can also find this timeline and a more detailed version of this timeline on the British Safety Council Awards website pages. The results for the International Safety Awards will be emailed to those that apply for the awards. So, that's just something to take note of. If you've purchased the award, but you yourself are not actually applying for the award, just so you're aware, the results are emailed to the applicant on the 10th of March, and the following day, these will be published on our website. If you'd like to find out more about your score and challenge the results that you've received, you will have an opportunity to do so until the 24th of March. Winners for the auto entry and the free to enter awards will be notified via email by the 27th of April and winners will be announced formally at our Interna International Safety Awards Gala event on the 27th of May. Next slide, please. So the following list are our auto entry awards categories. As the name suggests, these are auto entries, so you will be automatically included into these categories when you apply for your International Safety Award. The sector best in country, best in company and chief adjudicators award for the highest scoring, scoring application will be announced publicly at the International Safety Awards Gala Dinner. Next slide, please. So this group are our free to enter awards. Um, the free to enter categories are the same as they were in previous years, so you might be familiar with some of these titles. So these awards are an excellent opportunity to highlight significant impact um, in other areas not necessarily captured in our International Safety Awards application. So as I mentioned previously, you don't need to purchase the International Safety Award to apply to any of these awards and the deadline for submission is the 3rd of March after the International Safety Awards submission. Next slide please. So next up um, is the International Safety Awards 2023 questions. And without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Chris and Neil, who will be tag teaming this section of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Cadman, and I am the assistant adjudicator to Neil, who is the chief adjudicator. I'm now going to uh, just go through a couple of things with you before we start on the questions. 
So next slide, please, Susanna. So before you begin your application, there are a number of things that you really need to swat up on to look through on the British Safety Council Awards website so that you can actually um, put in a really, really good, solid application. The first point to consider is the word limit, which is now 600 words per question. And what we actually recommend here is that rather than going into the website and actually putting your application directly um, into your application, then do it onto a Word document. That way you can check your word count and you can also amend and check that everything that you need to consider is within your answer before you actually put it up onto the website. Point two is read the command word appendix before you begin. And by the command word, I mean either describe or indeed explain. And actually, if you go into the British Safety Council uh, website, into your ISA, ISO, sorry, your International Safety Awards 2023 uh, page, you will find an appendix at the bottom of that page. And on there, you will find um, a description or an explanation of those two words. So to describe, to provide a detailed factual account of relevant significant factors and to explain, to demonstrate a clear understanding of the subject matter. Point three on there, read the evidence appendix. And evidence is where you can pick up some bonus marks and it's really important that you do that because of course every mark counts towards you achieving either a pass, a merit, or indeed a distinction, which I'm sure you would all be aiming for. So again, you'll find the evidence appendix on the login page of your International Safety Awards. And that is exactly how you'll gain your bonus marks. And there are, I think it's four, three questions where you can gain these bonus marks. Uh, next slide, please, Susanna. So the very first thing to consider when you come to your first question is to break down the question. Always look at every part of the question before you start to answer it. So the first thing is to explain what you are doing and then why you are doing it. It's really important that we understand exactly what it is you're trying to tell us. We, we don't know, we can't guess. Uh, if, we, if we are marking your application, we have to be able to see exactly what you're telling us. So explain what you are doing, explain why you are doing it, explain how you are doing it. And then most importantly, what is the outcome? In other words, did all of that work? And if it didn't, then you can explain why. And then you can actually show us how you actually achieved the outcome you wanted. Thank you. I'd like to next slide, please. And now Neil will take over. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, my name's Neil Stone. Um, I hope I am unmuted. Um, a big thank you to, to Ruth and Susanna and, and Chris uh, for making today possible. Um, just a couple of things before we go into the questions. Now we'll be brief, I promise. Um, we've got a team of adjudicators. Um, there'll be approximately 10 adjudicators. What we do is we have a moderation meeting uh, close to the closing date, where what we do is we mark some uh, specimen applications to ensure that the, uh, the adjudicators are consistent in their marking. Uh, and what we want to avoid is obviously big differences in how the adjudicators mark. That works well. We also have a review process where borderline applications and a sample number of applications um, are, are looked at uh, by a small number of adjudicators, again, to ensure consistency. The most important thing for me to say right at the outset is that we want applications to succeed. You know, this is not about knocking you back and having you fail. We want you to succeed. You know, what we're trying to do 
is to bring forward new awards to drive excellence in the management of health and safety. And what we want to do is to see what you're doing, as Chris explained, how you're doing it, why you're doing it, and, and what the impact is. And there's some brilliant stories that come through these awards. Um, but just make sure, don't rush into completing your application. Make sure that you give yourself time. As Chris said, do it in draft first, have another pair of eyes look over the application and make sure that you're presenting the evidence that puts your organisation in the best possible light to get a really high score. And uh, as Chris said, the additional marks, uh, and we've reduced the number of questions this year where there are additional marks, the additional marks might make the difference between uh, a pass and a merit or a merit and a distinction. Um, so don't lose sight of that. So the first question, as it says, it's not marked. This is the context that we need as judges to know what you're doing at the site for which the application is submitted. So don't scrimp on this. Make sure that you're actually giving us a picture. I, I always look at this and I read it a couple of times as a judge because I want to know what you're doing, who's employed at your site, the activities that they're involved in. So important to get this right. So don't don't under, underestimate this particular question just because there's no marks attached. This is a contextual question that so helpfully informs the judges to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Next slide, please. So this is the one, again, not marked, but actually really runs right through the whole question set. So we want to know what are the most significant issues at the site in relation to these three areas? OK, and this is what we're coming back to time and time again in terms of the subsequent questions. Uh, and um, you, you, as it said, what is the most significant issues? Don't try to identify all of the issues at the site in relation to occupational health hazards, safety hazards and well-being concerns. But the ones that you consider to be the most significant an example, one example of each of those three categories. Next slide, please, Susanna. Right, this is where we you start picking up marks. And as you can see, in terms of question three, this links back to question two and also what you do at your site in question one. Set out your organization's key health, safety, well-being policies, okay? And also, so that is absolutely critical because it sets the tone for the rest of your answers. This year, We've actually made two slight changes, so don't overlook this because this could make the difference between three marks and four more marks and four marks and five marks. Say, summarise how you ensure your policies align with relevant health and safety legislation. You might have one person in your organisation who does that job. You might have a team of doing it. You might have a mechanism in place. Summarise how you do that. Summarise how you ensure that you're conforming with legislation within your country, OK? and within your particular industry. And you can do that briefly, but to make sure you do that because it does attract extra marks. And sorry, it does ensure that you get a, a, a good score for that particular question. Describe the main channels for communicating the policies of staff to your site. And I'll come back to that in, uh, in the next slide, which is question 3B. Next slide, please, Susanna. Right, okay. So, we do want evidence here, going back to question on the uh, previous slide, 3A, give three examples of communication channels used at your site. Uh, OK, so it could be toolbox talks. It could be the use of um, you know, your company website. Just think of three ways that you communicate uh, with your workers at your site and just detail what they are. And what it says is, um, so it's got to be relevant uh, and it's got to be informative. Um, yes, we will accept pictures uh, as example, as, as evidence of what you're doing. So you might want to show a, a picture of a team meeting or a toolbox tool, for example, of a seminar that you've organised. If you if you submit a picture as supporting evidence, do please explain uh, the reason why. Um, that picture is, is being attached as evidence. Just don't attach a picture with a group of guys standing around chatting. Just say what they're actually talking about. OK, so next slide. And that's back to Chris, please. Thank you, Neil. 
Uh, right, so question 4A. We're now referring back to question two, where you identified um, the significant hazards or significant hazards within your workplace. And remember, it is in your workplace. It isn't in the company per se. It's actually the place that you work in. So you identified um, three hazards, which were occupational health, um, safety and well-being. And what you're asking to, be, to do here is to actually describe the controls that you have in place for managing the risks of just one of those hazards. So not all of them, don't write all three because the adjudicators will only take the first one into account and you're mm -hmm. using up all your words if you go into all the three when you need to actually describe quite succinctly uh, exactly what you do to manage the risks from one of those significant hazards. And as Neil was saying, um, depending on whether you want to get a distinction or a merit or indeed a pass, then follow the guidelines. So they're, uh, as it says, a comprehensive description of the controls that are in place for managing just one of the significant hazards. So when you do your draft, make sure you refer back to the question and indeed to the mark scheme so that you actually know that you're covering the information that's needed. Remember, as I said to you before, we don't know, um, we can't guess what you're trying to say. So you need to say, don't assume that we understand what you're saying, make it very clear. Okay, thank you. Can we move on, Susanna? And again, this is a question where you will gain an extra mark if you uh, put in place, uh, show us some how you are effective in the control measure you have described in 4A. So in other words, did that control measure work? And how did you make sure it did? How did you check? How did you monitor the effectiveness of that control measure? And what we need here is, is some evidence to show it. It might be um, an audit or um, anything, anything at all that, where you might have gone around the workplace, looked at a, a, a risk assessment, looked at the hazard, seen whether control measures were working and then decided whether it was effective or not. It might be that somebody becomes ill or is injured, therefore the control measure maybe hasn't worked. So what did you do about it? And that is really important that you get an extra one mark for that. Thank you. If we can move on to Neil now. Right, the next question is question five, all about KPIs. Can I just say, uh, prefacing this question, the next one, which I'll cover. Um, if you haven't read uh, the Chief Adjudicator's report from 2022 awards, please do so. It's accessible online. It's worth spending 10 minutes just to have a look at what scored well last year, and what scored um, poorly. Uh, and it is important for you to, to get to grips with that. Um, and if you're, particularly if you're entering the International Safety Awards for the uh, first time, do look at that very, very carefully. Um, as I said, we want you to succeed and it is a useful tool uh, for helping uh, to ensure that you get as many marks as possible. Question five is about KPI performance targets. Give one example of a target currently in place and describe how the progress of a target is measured. Okay, however, importantly, going down, we ask you to describe how they are developed. You know, that is the first thing, that, that's the first leg of a question that we're asking. How are they developed? Who develops them? Uh, and how they're developed? Uh, and then you're being asked to give one example of a target currently in place and describe how the progress of a target is measured. Again, say why that target came about okay uh, why was it considered important to have a target re relating to that particular health and safety performance how it's been formulated how it's being monitored how it's being assessed and how it's being measured um, so it's it's really you know again a critical question although all the questions have got the same number of marks i mean except those that have got a supplementary mark for evidence this is important critically important okay next slide please Susanna right <clears throat> there's two questions here which are linked question six and question seven um, as some of you will know who've uh, applied and been successful in the awards in previous years 
There are certain questions that come up year in, year out. We have introduced new questions this year. We've dropped some. Um, we always ask two things you can be absolutely certain that we're going to ask you questions about the role of a senior management in leading on health and safety and how, how that actually operates. And we're also going to ask how you actively involve your workforce in terms of ensuring that uh, they're properly involved in uh, effectively managing the, the risks uh, to the health and safety at that side. So question six, uh, identify members of senior executives with key responsibilities and describe how they're involved in the formulation uh, of objectives at your site. Where organisations have fallen down in previous years is by actually identifying senior members, for example, board directors, uh, senior executives who actually have a role in health and safety, but there's been insufficient detail for us to understand precisely how they're involved. You know, uh, just saying our managing director takes health and safety very, very seriously and it's number one item on our board agenda and all the board are involved, it doesn't tell us enough. We want to know how that, you know, how that works. We want to know what makes it tick, you know, and, and you've got to you've got to provide explanations of, of how that how they're actually involved. So if there is a board meeting monthly, quarterly, uh, an annual review of health and safety at which your senior executives actually attend and get involved in the discussions, then please detail how that works. OK, this is so important. We want to know not just that they, they take an interest and they take health and safety seriously, but we want to know how they actually do that. You know, there's a world of difference between saying, yes, they are involved and they do take it seriously and what they actually do to ensure that the organisation and the site is successful in ensuring that risks are properly managed. Uh, next slide, which is oh, back to you, Chris. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Neil. OK, so. As Neil was saying, it's absolutely vital that senior executives are involved and are engaged in everything that you do on your site. And we need to know, as Neil said, exactly how that works. So de detail the arrangements you have in place to measure the extent and effectiveness of senior executives' engagement activities on your site. So in other words, does your senior exec, um, whoever that might be, do they come down onto the into the you know and, and mingle mingle amongst you? Do they hold meetings? Um, do they do do KPIs with you? Maybe um, do they come around and audit with maybe one of your line managers? So in other words, the extent. It's not just a case of somebody sitting in an office and just saying, "Oh yes, I sign the policy." That isn't actually engagement activity. It's 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 just signing a policy, which of course they have to do. So what we're looking for here is how you measure um, effectiveness. So in other words, you ask you ask, you ask your staff. You have 360 degree feedback. You have performance appraisals. You have team meetings. All the things that you actually do to ensure that the senior management engagement is effective, if it works, are the staff happy with it? Do the staff feel cared for? Do they feel that they've had the training they need? Do the senior management get involved in that? So there's so much you can put into this question. So again, a comprehensive description of the arrangements the organisation has in place to measure the effectiveness, and remember that word is really vital. So does it work? Are people satisfied that the CNE management do enough? What do they do to ensure that? So in other words, as much as you can about the involvement. Uh, next slide, please, Susanna. And here we have yet another opportunity for a bonus mark. And what we want here is one, note the word detailed, please, one detailed example of effective engagement activity on your site. And again, as Neil suggested, that could be a photograph, but we need to understand what the photograph's telling us. Uh, but it might be that the management go around and do um, 
an inspection maybe once a month or something and they accompany maybe your line manager they come into the workplace and they talk to you that's effective engagement so um, an actual um, audit sheet or an inspection sheet with a, a we know with a signature on it to say that the senior management were there that's exactly what we'd be looking for here remember please it has to be um, it has to be it has to be adhering to the requirements and will be considered by the adjudicators but it has to be relevant to the particular um, question that it, that's been asked thank you next slide please right well we're all very familiar with COVID-19 um, I think every organization in the world has had to change their policies and procedures to include um, a potential pandemic in the future as well so what did you have to do in your workplace and remember this is your work site i mean there might have been um, a corporate um, a corporate decision made and a corporate policy sent down to your workplace but please remember that your answer has to be related to your workplace so once you received your instructions from maybe your head office then what did you do at your workplace and what changes did you have to make in order to uh, deal with the COVID-19 pandemic? And most importantly, that, there, you know, COVID-19 is always going to be around and there are always going to be variants of that. So there very well could be future pandemics of, of who knows what. So what is in place now to ensure that there are contingency arrangements there to deal with any future pandemic. So again, a comprehensive description of the changes made to policies, procedures, and contingency arrangements. As I already said, I do understand, and we do understand at the British Safety Council, that policies will probably be corporate, but how you implement them, how you communicate them, how you discuss it with your people, whether it works or not, all of these things are really, really important because it brings it down to your particular site. So uh, thank you. Next slide, please. And back to Neil. I won't be a second. Can I just go back to the COVID question? And I, I promise I'm not going to repeat what Christine said. We had a question on COVID, as many of you will know, uh, in 2022, <clears throat> and we asked how you are dis uh, communicating your COVID arrangements to your staff. This particular question attracted the highest number of high scores. So there's some absolutely wonderful examples of what organisations were doing to actually ensure uh, that uh, the risk of infection within the workplace and to the workforce was minimised or uh, removed completely, if that's possible. But there's some really good examples. Where organisations fell down in answering that question was failing to explain how they communi communi communicated the controls to the workforce effectively. As Christine said, you know, we are going to be faced with COVID going forward. Uh, you only have to look at the statistics that uh, the World Health Organization are publishing uh, regularly, almost on a daily basis still, to know, to know that this is still with us and that there will be future pandemics. So this is uh, not scaremongering, this is coping with a reality. Um, uh, so, you know, don't, don't lose sight of the importance of what you have actually done within your organization to, to, to respond to the, the COVID pandemic. Question nine, this is about auditing. Uh, what is clear is that so many organisations who apply for the award now have come successfully through ISO 45001. Even those organisations who haven't gone down the ISO 45001 route have their health, safety and wellbeing policies and procedures audited uh, on a very regular basis. So what we're asking you here is to provide three examples of how you have picked up outcomes or recommendations coming out of an audit what you've done okay uh, one so describe the arrangements you have in place for auditing uh, your policies and procedures how that's carried out who's who does it how it's carried how who you involve in that process okay and then pick up on if you uh, 
as, as, as the question says, pick up on three examples how you've implemented an audit outcome or recommendation. Now remember, given the word limit of 600, you need to be succinct here, but do give three examples, okay? If you give one example, but not three, that is gonna mean uh, a lower mark. So really, uh, go back to your latest audit, have a look at three recommendations. It could be, you know, there. It could be that the recommendation might be to make a simple, small change that actually can have an impact on your performance. So just think, have a think about what examples put your organisation in the best possible light to get a good score. Next slide, please, Susanna. <coughs> now, um, again, this is a question that attracts five marks, question 10 on uh, PPE. Now, you could argue that if you're running a chemical uh, processing plant or a construction site, uh, the requirements regarding PPE would be far more onerous than if you're an office-based uh, organization. The key thing is, is ensuring that you've got the necessary effective PPE in place to protect your workforce, whether it's a high hazard, medium hazard, or low hazard workplace. If you're a low hazard workplace, you're not going to be marked down because you need less PPE than if you are operating a construction site, a chemical site or a, a power plant. So don't don't think that. Think, why have we got the arrangements in place regarding PPE? The processes, describe the processes that you have in place, OK, for assessing PPE needs that you need to provide to your workforce, in, uh, ensuring that it's fit for purpose. Now, you may have an example. This is a question It's not designed to catch you out. It's designed to understand what you do in, in the event that you conclude clearly um, by your experience, by the experience of workers, that PPE you're using, although um, your assessment is that it's effective uh, and it's the right PPE to use, uh, has proved uh, uh, inadequate uh, or ineffective. Uh, and just explain what you've done. In that, in that event to actually remedy the situation. So this is shown that you're on the ball, you're very, very uh, clearly keeping uh, the effectiveness of PPE under the spotlight and what you're doing in those rare cases where you feel that PPE is not up to scratch. As I said, it's not trying to catch you out, it's just trying to ensure that you know, you're con constantly aware of the need uh, to ensure that the PPE that you, you have um, procured and are using at your site is being used effectively. Okay, next slide please, Susanna, back to you, Chris. Thank you, Neil. Okay, so um, we mentioned before uh, on the previous slide about senior management and whether staff were, were happy with the way the management um, engage with them well this question looks at how you your staff raise concerns about their health or their safety or indeed their well-being now it would this would need to start off with a procedure and a process as to how you actually so what do you have do you have toolbox talks do you have meetings um, do you have surveys do you have KPI is where people sit with their manager and talk through their concerns. Maybe you have a simple process like a suggestion box that might be in the staff canteen or somewhere and they put their concerns in there. Obviously, uh, we would need to understand from your application um, how this actually works. So start off from the beginning. Tell us exactly what you have in place how this works, how the staff know that, how, what they have to do, how do you communicate, how do you consult with the staff as to how they can raise concerns. And quite importantly also, um, if the staff was to raise concerns, that they wouldn't be penalised for raising those concerns. So this is all really important. Um, so what we're looking for here are three examples of how concerns that have been raised have been addressed. And of course, like everything else, for the top band, we would need to know that the concerns have been resolved and then on a 
on a, on a rotation that they go back into the procedures and processes that you already have in place. So you've improved. So you're improving your systems all the time. So that's three examples you would need to, to give there. So uh, moving on to the next slide, please, Susanna. Now this one, and I, I'm quite convinced that every single organization always has contractors who come onto site who provide different services it might be maintenance it might be it might be auditing it might be anything at all anything at all but what we're looking for here is looking at your procedures and policies and objectives and how you actually ensure that the contractor who comes on site actually complies with your organization's health, safety and well-being policies, procedures and objectives. So obviously the first thing you need to consider if you are bringing a contractor on site is to identify the job that needs to be done and then you need to ensure the contractor's competency and there'll be a series of questions that you would ask of them, um, all sorts of questions and I'm sure you all have that in place. Um, you would need to know whether they'd had any accidents in the past. You would need to see a site of their policies and their procedures, because obviously what's important is that their procedures fit in with your procedures and your policies. So you would have this selection process. So this question starts with that process. So once you've identified the job, then your selection process comes into place. And eventually, the contractor will be given the go-ahead and he will come onto your site to do whatever task, job, whatever is he's, he's coming on to do. But then of course you've got to monitor and ensure that your staff understand that, that we have contractors on site and therefore they need to ensure that they follow your own procedures and the contractor is following them as well. So you might have to have an inspection once a day just to check, dependent on, on whatever the contractor is doing, obviously, um, and in you've been inspecting what they're doing, making sure, ticking the boxes, making sure that emergency procedures are in place and that they're following and that they understand and know what your emergency procedures are. And indeed, that you're communicating all the time with your own staff so that they are fully aware as to what the contract is actually doing on your site. OK, so again, a comprehensive description of the arrangements in place at the site for ensuring contractor compliance. So it's a start to finish process. Thank you. Back to Neil. So, so <clears throat> the next slide is Susanna is questions. Can I just uh, quickly cover uh, the marking arrangements in a bit, bit more detail when it comes to the, the supportive evidence. So as Chris and I have explained, you've got 10 questions that attract a maximum five marks each. There's three questions where there's one additional supplementary mark for evidence. And we've also, very importantly, mustn't forget the fact that there's marks attributed for accreditation certification. So we did have a question earlier. You we will give one additional mark for an organization that's come through uh, a three star uh, a five star audit scoring three stars two marks for an organization who's come through the british safety council's five star audit and has got four stars and three marks to an organization that's come through our five star audit has got five stars however separately um, and it's not additional marks if you come through got a current iso 5001 certification then you get two marks for that. So um, you can pick up a possible maximum of three marks from the accreditation evidence. So that's, if my maths is right, that's a maximum top score of 58. So um, if you've got ISO 45001 and also you've done the British Safety, Safety Council five star awards, that's not two plus three or three plus three additional, two plus three or two plus two additional marks. It's you get one mark for three stars, two marks for four stars, three marks for five stars. If you've got ISO 45001, you'll get two marks for that if you haven't gone through the British Safety Council uh, five star audit scheme. You do not have to have the ISO certification carried out by BSC. 
there's a whole number, as you know, certificate certification bodies who carry out um, uh, ISO 45001. What was interesting is that there is an increasing number of applications who submit their management, uh, uh, health and safety management uh, procedures to external verification through the ISO 45001 route. So if you've done it, don't forget to attach evidence in other words, a certificate, because that will earn you additional marks. Also, uh, just to say that um, uh, a number of organisations last year, and uh, I hope that Chris agrees with me, uh, have ISO 45001 certification carried out for the organisation. Uh, it doesn't necessarily be site specific. If, if it's for the organisation, then the adjudicators have taken a view, then, then that will attract the additional marks. Um, but if it's for a site specific and it's not relevant to your particular site, then you won't get the marks. So I hope I've explained that clearly and haven't totally confused. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks very much, Neil. I think you've explained that very well. <laughs> um, so we have actually got quite a lot of questions to get through. So what I'll probably do is just amalgamate those where I can. And if you feel your question hasn't been answered at the end of the webinar, we will follow up with you. Or you can also email the awards inbox um, at britsafe.org if you have any further questions after the webinar. So uh, first of all, there's quite a few questions about um, the webinar itself. So whether or not somebody can access the slides and the webinar following the webinar. So just so you're aware, we will be following up with the slides and the recording. So you can access this um, after today as well. And please feel free to share that with any team colleagues who are also submitting applications um, so that they can get up to speed also. So there's quite a few questions as well, Neil, which I, I think you have covered this, but I'm just going to, I'm going to read out this question again, uh, just in case I misunderstood something myself. So you said that you give bonus marks to companies with ISO 45001 certificate when evaluating the applications of the companies that receive the awards given by the British Safety Council, shouldn't they be given a bonus mark because they received this award? Um, uh Yes, I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a business angle to this, so I'll be absolutely clear. Um, of course, we'd like all applicant organisations to use uh, BSC's five-star audit system, but the reality is that uh, organisations don't necessarily do that. ISO 45001 certification is incredibly important. Um, you can pick up two additional marks if you successfully come through 45001, whether or not this has been carried out by the British Safety Council, BSI, uh, Norska Veritas, whoever, providing they're a certified body. Um, the additional mark that you get will be if you've successfully come through five star. These are, you know, let's not look, these are additional marks. They are important. I'm not going to under, um, uh, understate the importance of the additional marks, whether it's for the supplementary evidence or whether it's for accreditation. Um, but if you've really done well, uh, in terms of answering the 10 questions and providing the supplementary evidence, and you've come through 45,001, you stand a very, very good chance of getting a distinction. Um, you know, should we give you extra marks because you've come through BSC's uh, ISO 45,001 rather than the external uh, certification body? Uh, the judge's view and the view of BSC is no, we shouldn't. That would be not fair. Yeah. So we've, we're trying to be as fair as possible. Yes, if you've come through five star and you've got five stars, then you're um, going to be uh, one mark ahead of a game. Um, but remember, um, uh, although we've said one mark can make the difference between a pass and a merit, the merit and distinction, um, really you must not lose sight. You've got to maximise your score on each of the 10 questions by aiming to get five or four on every question. OK. Thanks very much, Neil. That's really clear. So there are also a number of questions um, about the word limit and also is there a word limit for part B of the question? So that's quite simple. I'm happy to answer that. Um, so there is a word limit of 600 words per question. And as Chris mentioned earlier, it's probably best to write your questions in a Word document and then copy and paste them into the platform so you can keep um, you know, you can keep on top of the, the words, the number of words in your questions. We won't penalise people if they're close to the 600 mark. But also with regards to the part B's of questions where you're being asked to submit supporting evidence, the word limit doesn't apply in the same way on that. So if the document that you're submitting 
um, or if it ind indeed is a document that you're submitting, we won't penalise you if you're over 600 on that. There's another few questions, Neil and Chris, around um, could, could uh, applicants see some examples of previous projects or also some um, employee wellbeing concerns? Um, sorry, Ruth, uh, are applicants asking if they can see examples of um, previous answers? Yes, that's it. Well, I, I, what I would say is that um, I don't know, I know that, the, look, listen, the Chief Adjudicator's report for last year is up on up on the site, okay? And I think if it, if it was possible to still have the Adjudicator's report from the previous year up on the site, um, what what you've got to do when it comes to uh, well-being, um, I mean, you've just, you know, although we haven't asked a question specifically on well-being, it could be that when you come come to answer the, the sorry if I can go back bear with me just a second and I'll explain what I mean and then Chris can help me out here right okay so question two one of the things that you're being asked to identify is a significant significant example of a well-being concern okay now you might say well isn't there an overlap here between occupational health and well-being of course there is but one of your well-being concerns might be uh, the fact that um, uh, a number of your workers uh, smoke uh, and we all know that the evidence quite clearly is that smoking damages your health. You might say well look that's one of the issues that we've raised um, because we feel that it does have impact on the health of our workforce. It is a well-being concern so don't be too you know don't be too tied up by trying to delineate between occupational health and well-being. There may be issues around alcohol, there may be issues around um, uh, issues to do with um, uh, tiredness, physical well-being, um, you know, whether or not, um, you know, obesity. Um, so, you know, just think broadly in terms of well-being concern. Think of one particular initiative that you could brand as well-being that your organisation has actually uh, addressed and tried to tackle. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's a bit difficult because we we can't offhand. I can't really uh one of the um, answers to question two from last year up uh, to put on the website but if we can if we can have a look at that we'll have a look at some of the answers that we had last year in terms of examples being given of uh, well-being concerns and if we can stick that up Ruth we will do okay but I haven't got the applications with me here in my little room uh, that I can immediately go to and say here's a good example of well-being concern but we'll have a look and we'll dig up some examples of what applicant organizations said does that make sense yeah absolutely yeah, that sounds good Neil so I think um yeah we'll read that out put it on the website or also we can also send it out to participants as well and notify them when that's when that's ready um, there's a couple of more questions around registration date and also um, eligibility for the scheme. So just to clarify, the submission deadline is the 10th of February um, and the, the closing date for registration is, is basically the 9th of February. So, so really we're just working to that deadline. Um, these, um, the International Safety Awards are global, so everyone is eligible to apply for these. So it's not just for British companies. There was a question quite uh, directly about that too. So we welcome applicants from all over the globe. Uh, we really want to um, be very clear on that. Um, there's a question here about from Emma saying, I appreciate that there are many large companies on this call. Is it worthwhile for small companies, less than 50 staff members um, applying um, you know, it, oh, apologies. Um, is it worthwhile for small companies to apply? So perhaps that's something, Chris, that you'd like to cover. Absolutely, yes. There's absolutely no reason why a small company with maybe 50 people can't apply. I mean, it'll be a lot easier for a smaller company to actually ensure that every member of staff is consulted, communicated with. And that, and that you have a, a really good handle on, on and we were talking about the well-being aspect, on indeed people's mental and physical health. Um, so I would suggest that yes, you could put a very, very good application in for a small company. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so there's 
there's there's a lot of questions. So as I mentioned earlier, um, if we don't get to cover your question here this morning, we will certainly follow up with you directly. Um, so there's another question around, is there a portal where we need to upload, submit our application? So there is indeed. Um, so the awards platform is our is 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 it's an it's a it's a BSC a British Safety Council platform, and when you purchase your application and pay in full, you will get an email giving you or giving you information about how to access that platform. So we will be sending a number of emails to all of you um, in the weeks coming up to the submission deadline with how to access that platform, and also we'll be inviting you to further webinars on that if you have any queries. Um, so I'm just trying to think, there's, there's quite a few questions, so I, I might just ask one or two more if that's okay, and then anything, as I mentioned, that we have uncovered will follow up with you directly. So there's a question here um, asking, is it correct that there are additional marks if we have the British Safety Council to carry out audits? So either Chris or Neil, whoever wants to pick that one up. Well, yes, I mean, if, if you've, um, if you've uh, your organisation has undergone uh, BSC's five star audit and you've come away with three, four or five stars, then that's additional marks. But you don't get additional marks for coming through three through the five star scheme in addition to the ISO 45001. It's one or the other. Perfect. Thank you very, thank you very much, Neil. Great. OK, so I'm just scanning the rest of the, the questions here. So unfortunately, um, just to, just to confirm, um, we don't we, we don't receive the applications in Chinese or any other language other than English. Um, so our adjudication team assess all of the applications, um, and and the supporting documentation also needs to be in English uh, currently. Um, I think that we've covered most, and also as well, just to confirm, um, if you're successful in the International Safety Awards, uh, you'll be invited to attend our ISA gala, and you'll also be able to showcase your success uh, with an International Safety Awards certificate, and also we'll give you the opportunity to purchase um, trophies and plaques as well, sh should you want to showcase that even further um, in, your, in your office. Okay, I think um, I'll, I just, well, there's quite a, there's one more question at the end I'll read out and then I think we'll probably need to, to wrap up. So good morning, I am an event safety consultant going to apply for the ISA 2023 with two proposed of events for our health and safety team. I was wondering whether this structure of questions is suitable for our case. In addition, is it possible to contact the explainers of the questions? Um, for further explanation over this, um, so I think I think the question here is is really to do with whether or not um, it's it's a site specific thing or an organisation wide initiative. So perhaps something that uh, you want to cover, Chris. Sorry, can you actually repeat the? I didn't quite hear what um, what the question was. Can, so, can I? Uh, I mean, quickly. I mean, this is something that we grapple with. And uh, if I understand the question is um, whether or not you're submitting your application as an organisation wide application or site specific. Site specific. Um, if it's a very small organisation, then obviously if it's an organisation with only one site, then you no, know, that's understandable. But, you know, one of the one of the problems we've had in previous years, and this is a reason why um, Chris and I, the adjudicators and BSC have actually changed the nature of the questions and we keep reiterating throughout the questions, this is about the site, is that we had a lot of answers uh, that were being given in the past, which were basically organised policies, procedures, examples, which weren't specific to the site. So we want to see uh, the answers uh, to the questions relate to the specific site that's applied. So I hope, I hope that answers the question now. Going back to the small organisation, if it's a small organisation, they've got one site or one office, then it's that's fine. But where you're a large organisation uh, and, you know, you're being asked to give it evidence, um, you know, it could be you might say, well, yes, but our health and safety policies and procedures apply to the whole organisation. How the hazards will vary from site to site. So that's the reason why we're really trying to find out you know, what is happening and what is taking place at the particular site. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Neil. 
Okay, so one final question and then and then we'll wrap up. Um, so this last one is from Hazib and it's as a vocational training centre giving associate, associated uh, diploma degree, can we participate in this event? No reason why not. You know, if it's a workplace and there's people working there uh, and it's a training centre and they're training people and they've got hazards in the workplace and they're managing those hazards, um, there'd be no reason why. You know, going back to the question that we received from uh, one of the attendees, of course, we want to see applications from all organisations, whether you're high, medium or low hazard, whether you're a large multinational or whether or not you're local in a particular country. Uh, you know, this scheme, the international award scheme is designed for all organisations, irrespective of what they do or what their size is or who owns them. So don't be put off. If you're a small organisation, we want to see your applications. And remember, there were examples. If you look at the winners from 2022 and 2021, yes, there were a lot of organisations there, um, but there were a lot of organisations who submitted applications for specific individual sites. Good, that worked for us. And don't overlook the fact that 20% of the applicants last year got a distinction and 29% got a merit. So, you know, there's real success here. So uh, well done. Uh, start thinking about your answers. Give yourself plenty of time. Uh, look forward to receiving your applications. Thanks very much, Neil. So I think that's all we have time for today. And um, just to confirm, we will be sharing the webinar slides and also the recording with those that have attended today. So please feel free to share this with any colleagues who are unable to attend. And um, thank you very much to all of our participants for joining us today and for all of your very interesting questions. And um, if you feel uh, you still have any further questions, just please drop us an email at awards at Britsafe.org and we can pick those up for you. Um, a huge thank you to Chris and Neil for joining us today and sharing their expertise. Um, I hope uh, you found this as useful as I have. And best of luck with your submissions. We really look forward to receiving them um, in February. And um, thank you again for joining us today.